Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the MMA card from a betting perspective for uh, this Saturday's card. Um, again, for those of you that follow us on DFS, the approach to uh, the betting breakdown is completely different than that of DFS. And uh, just to kind of review, when you're playing daily fantasy sports, one of the overarching presumptions is that the Vegas lines and the props associated with the Vegas lines are somewhat efficient. And then what you do is you go ahead and you project how well a, a fighter is going to score uh, on DraftKings based on uh, based on those props and based on those odds and based on what those odds imply. Um, so the way you get edge in DraftKings and you know in daily fantasy sports is not necessarily getting an edge over the line. It's learning how to apply that line to get an edge in projections or to get an edge in lineup construction or things like that. However, if you're going to actually make straight wagers on the fights, whether that be to win or on the props, you are by definition presuming that there's something wrong with the line, that you are better than the sum of the entire betting public that has made those lines. Now, that again could be a very daunting presumption to make, but that's what people do. Like whenever you are wagering on anything, whether it be, you know, basketball, baseball, UFC, the stock market, you know, anything where there's some type of VIG involved, some type of transaction cost, the only way that you can have an edge is if there is something wrong with the line. If your assessment is better than what the entire uh, civilized world that's been betting on this fight or on this stock or on this sport has come up with as the efficient line. Um, now that's not to say that it's impossible, but it's extremely difficult, you know, especially when you're dealing with MMA, when you're dealing with, you know, uh, sometimes 30, 40 cent big or something like that. So if you're going to engage in this, you have to figure out another way to get an edge other than just, I don't know, pretending that you are much better at analyzing the fights than everybody else. However, the way I approach MMA betting is the same way that I approach any type of wagering, which is also the same way I approach investing in the stock market and investing in stocks, is that you could presume at the beginning that the lines are efficient. However, some of what goes into that line is bias. Some of what goes into that line is, um, you know, narrative. Some of what goes into that line is just basic public perception or or where whether a certain stock or a sport or a or a team or a fighter is just likable or if people want him to win or or if there's a narrative that's so easy to tell, then those lines are by definition going to be overvalued, right? I mean, you think about it, if you presume from the beginning that the line is efficient, then part of what goes into that line is nonsense and part is reality. And the stuff that play, preys on human emotions, such as recency bias and likable fighters versus unlikable fighters, likable stocks versus unlikable stocks, that's the type of thing that you have to fade if you want to obtain good value. Now, again, if you if you approach things this way, it is completely going to mess with your life. It's completely going to mess with your brain. It's going to turn you into those people that everybody hates, the people that play don't pass and craps, the people who are rooting against everything that everybody else is rooting for. However, if you're willing to go down that road, I promise you that you're going to get a lot better EV than just just staring at it and going, oh, wow, I presume this guy's a knockout artist. Everybody seems to think he's going to knock the guy out. I'm going to play him in the first round. Or this is a great stock. They make they make good uh, they make good products. I, maybe I'll buy it. Well, duh. I mean, that's why everybody else has bought it. Okay. If you start to act like a contrarian and behave like one, you are going to do better. Um, so uh, again, that's, that's a big introduction. All I can tell you is this that I am not nearly the expert as a lot of the MMA betters are. Um, however, people that have been following this approach, we're doing very, very well. Now, again, it's a very small sample size. You know, we've been doing it for like six months or something like that. But trust me, if you engage in this type of analysis it, for MMA betting, it will actually transform you into a better wagerer 
throughout the wagering community and even throughout, uh, you know, assessing stock market stuff and everything else. So nonetheless, um, let's get into it. For those of you who haven't followed this type of analysis before, it is going to frustrate you, but this is the way it is. Um, what you have to look for in all of these fights is the is the overwhelming majority and the overwhelming consensus of what will happen and basically never bet that, okay? Because what happens with MMA more than almost any sport is that people kind of settle on a completely binary outcome, okay? And I don't just mean one fighter is going to win over another fighter. People talk themselves into this one, that if this fighter is going to win, it's going to be by this method. Or if this fighter is going to win, it's going to be by this method and almost dismissing all other methods of victory. And remember, there's a lot of variance involved in MMA fighting. And that is an important thing to understand going in. Okay? So the good thing also about doing this breakdown near the end of the week, and it's already what, almost Friday night, is that I've been able to absorb pretty much all of the nonsense. In other words, I know exactly what the community is thinking. I know exactly what takes have been kind of like leaped on by other people. And this is this is what happens with, with crowd think, okay? Enough people say it, more people will believe it. And then the line will continue to get, get wider and, and, and things will become more and more overbet. And you want to be on the opposite sides of that. So let's just get right into it. And first, let's go over the rules. Um, for every fight, we are going to bet every fight, okay? And we are going to bet one unit on every fight. Um, maybe that's not the greatest money management in the world. I don't care. Want to sweat these fights. It should be fun. And so I bet one unit on every fight. And for me, that's $180, okay? We're up about like 6000 doing this, but we're just going to continue at $180 per, per unit. And we're going to bet every single fight. And I'm going to bet every one of them uh, right here to show you that I'm doing it, okay? Um, so with that said, let's just get right into it. So first fight of the night, we have Jacqueline Amarim versus Sam Hughes. So Jacqueline Amarim is a, um, first time starter, so to speak, coming out of the, uh, LFA. Uh, she's the LFA champ and she's fighting kind of a, uh, UFC veteran who is, you know, uh, basically, uh, I don't want to say hated people like her, but she's kind of a punching bag. I mean, people, people, you know, don't, don't think too much of her. And the idea is that Jacqueline Amram is going to be brought in as kind of a, a setup fight. Okay? Not to mention the fact that she has finished all of her battles in the last, uh, all of her wins, I think she's 6-7-0, in the first round. So you think about this from a, you know, a narrative and a uh, what the public is thinking perspective, okay? You have Sam, you have Amram as a minus 265, Sam Hughes a plus 225. I have heard both sides of this. I've heard that... Amarim is, is a rightful favorite. I've heard some Sam Hughes takes that it's just too wide. So as far as the money line goes, there's not a lot of the edge there. But here is the what I have heard is that Jacqueline Amarim is going to try to get her out of there in the first rounds. Okay. And the thing is, she might have limited cardio. So Jacqueline Amram's path to victory is very heavily based on the first round finishes because all of her wins are first round finishes. And if Sam Hughes wins, maybe she can just kind of stuff the takedown and survive and win kind of a point battling decision. So what that means is that there are two things you could bet here that are completely unbettable. Okay? Number one is anything involving Jacqueline Amarim in the first round, or for that matter, maybe even Jacqueline Amarim by, by finish in the second round probably going to be unbettable because that is like the one binary outcome people are pricing in. And the other thing you can't really bet is Sam Hughes inside the, uh, by decision. So you, the only thing I can really bet here is either Amarim by decision or maybe Sam Hughes inside the distance. Okay. Um, so we are going to take a look at the odds here. And I think what we're going to end up doing is probably take Amarim by decision. And that is Pretty reasonable. So it's plus 200 and plus 750 by TKO is pretty, pretty interesting. But Amram by decision, but plus 200 is, I think that's the way to go here. I really don't think anybody's playing this. I think that if people are playing Amram, they're playing her by finish. So we're going to try that. So Amram by decision for 180 at 200. Now we're going to set this up right here for now, but then we'll, 
we'll uh, we'll bet them all at the end. All right, next fight we have Shalane uh, Nurembeke versus Steve Garcia. All right, so here's the deal with this fight: you have Nurembeke, who is kind of, was a wrestler, uh, and you have Steve Garcia, who is not much of a wrestler. But what Steve Garcia did is in his last fight, he was went off on Chase Hooper. He knocked him out down three times and route to a first round finish as an underdog. And Nuren Beke, he basically won a fixed fight. That's that's what you're hearing. I'm not saying it was fixed, but uh, it was a fight against Derek Minner that it turns out uh, was he was injured and his trainer kind of let everybody know about it beforehand, sort of, and the line really moved. So Nuren Beke is kind of the hated guy in this, okay? But, but, with respect to the money line, I do feel as though that both sides of this are getting a little bit of love. Steve Garcia is definitely getting a little bit of, you know, a uh, little bit of action. So the money line is no good. But here's the thing. Steve Garcia, once again, is being priced that the only way he could possibly win is by is is maybe inside the first round or 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 maybe the second round. Nobody's really pricing him or talking about him ever winning by decision. It's, they're, they're really suggest, suggesting a binary outcome here. Where, where Nuren Beke, I'm hearing a lot that he's going to wrestle and control, maybe not much of a finisher, okay? So anything with him by decision is probably also going to be um, uh, somewhat overvalued. So what you're going to want to try here is either Nuren Beke by finish or Garcia by decision. So let's take a look at some of the odds that we can get on either of those two things. Because I think those that's the only value you're going to really see here. Let's take a look. Uh, winning method for openers. You have, well, let's look at round props. So Nuren Beke round one plus 240. There's not much of a leap from round one to round two, which is a little annoying. So I don't think I would do that. Round three is interesting at plus 850, but that's like more towards the, you know, uh, control, control, submission idea. Garcia by decision at plus 400, I kind of like that, okay? And you know what's kind of cool about this one? You know what you get? You get, um, you get, um, wait, we have Garcia, we have over there. Um, if if Nuren Beke really was kind of, I want to say accused of, of you know being part of a fixed fight um i'm not i wouldn't be so sure that he gets a decision if it gets to if it gets to it and likewise I mean, we have seen that the wrestlers who don't do much not really liked by the judges where the guys that kind of come out throwing like garcia is are, are much more inclined to be liked by the judges so for those two reasons i think garcia by decision is actually a pretty strong play here so garcia by decision at plus four hundred all right, moving on, we have Ignacio Bahamundes versus Trey Ogden. See, this, this I don't, I don't want to say I don't get it. I get it, okay? Is that Trey Ogden is, is they say he's very flawed. Uh, he, 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 his, he, uh, which I don't want to say he has no chance, but, but he's definitely the fighter that I have not seen a single person pick in this, in this match. Um, in his last fight, he was scheduled to fight, I want to say Trevin Giles, but I don't think so. I think it was somebody else. And he was going to be one of the more popular underdogs on the slate. And now all of a sudden, everybody hates him. Nobody is picking this guy. The Bahamundes in his last fight, you know, he was fighting somebody who was kind of a wrestler in, in, in Ranju, and he basically beat him up, okay? The other thing that I'm hearing is that Ogden, when he comes in for his takedowns, he leaves his neck exposed, and that Baja Mondays might be able to get a guillotine on him. So I have just not heard a single Trey Ogden take here as if he were like plus 800. But I will say this that Ogden, you know, he's got a path to victory in the wrestling. And if he can, in fact, hold Baja Mondays down, you know, he could get there at a very, very high price. So I'm going to take a shot at him. At plus 310. So Trey Ogden, and we're going to do 180 for all of these. So it would be, you're going to see at the end, I'll put 180 in the stake all singles category. 
Um, okay, moving on, we have Cynthia Calvillo versus Lupita Godinez. Though. So this one's really interesting. So here's what we got. We have Godinez, who is a minus 265 against Calvillo, plus 225. And the public is really off of Godinez right now. And you want to know why? Because everybody was expecting her to go for takedowns against Angela Hill, and she didn't, and she lost. So all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but she now is being known as the girl with the bad fight IQ. Okay. Uh, the other thing that I was hearing is that Cynthia Calvillo, you know, probably is going to miss weight, but it turns out that she did not miss weight. So now I have a feeling that that Calvillo is probably you know, going to get a, getting a little, a little more action here. So for me, I am actually going to take the Godinez side. And what we're going to do is we're going to play Godinez inside the distance here. So let's just take a look and see. Uh, Godinez with the bad fight IQ. My submission is plus 600. But plus, by TKO is plus 800. That would be ground and pound. We're just going to pick her inside the distance so let's take a look at this so you gotta look at second chance there so godinez by tk or submission plus 350 that's good enough for me for 180 all right carl williams versus chase sherman um i mean to me looks pretty easy you have chase you have carl williams who basically takes everybody down he, he beat the uh, Lawson, who was, who was a really, really good um, Penn State uh, wrestler. And then he came in against Breski and got eight takedowns against him. And then Chase Sherman, he basically has no takedown defense and everybody could take him down. So this is pretty easy to take Carl Williams. Uh, sounds, uh, however... Unfortunately, I can't just go and take Chase Sherman because he has been getting a little bit of love in the underdog community, okay? I've heard way too many semi-sharp people take Sherman, citing Carl Williams' um, uh, short notice and things like that. Now, Carl Williams has not really fought anybody. So, unfortunately, there's no money line value in either of these guys. But what you can do is kind of fade the narratives. So the idea is that the Carl Williams wins, he's going to take him down a bunch of times, and but he's probably not much of a finisher. And if Chase Sherman wins, it's going to be probably on the feet. So what we're probably going to have to do is probably play Carl Williams by finish. Um, so we're going to do that. It's kind of an ugly thing to do because, again, he really doesn't finish anybody. Well, let's take a look and see what his inside the distance prop. So winning method, Carl Williams by submission is plus 500. By TKO is plus 175, which basically implies uh, kind of a ground and pound situation. I haven't seen him finish anybody. And I haven't, I, so I don't really know whether he could be a submission guy or a TKO guy. So we're just going to play him either way. So Carl Williams inside the distance plus 130. All right, Gerald Nearshard versus Joe Pfeiffer. So this is a, a kind of a good illustra uh, a good fight to illustrate my point about about binary outcomes and what's overvalued. So here's the one bet. Well, there are two bets. Well, three bets. Three bets you cannot make in this fight. Number one is Gerald Nearshard by submission because. All I have heard is that that's the only path to victory. Now, if that's not bad enough, people are also honed in on round two or three submission because that's what he usually gets. So if you bet him a round three submission, that's terrible now. I promise you. It might happen, but it's bad value. And then secondarily, again, third, tertiarily, thirdly, GM3 in, by second round submission is also probably overvalued okay so all you can do in this fight all right is you can bet mirshar maybe by decision which is kind of gross you know you can play him by ko which is not happening so if you're going to play mirshar it's going to be by decision um however if you are going to play uh 
uh, Pfeiffer, what I've heard is that Mearshart is chinny, that that Pfeiffer is going to probably get the KO in the first or second round. And then if it gets that second or third rounds, then you better watch out because Mearshart is going to be uh, live for submission. So what we're going to probably do, we're going to go either Pfeiffer by decision or Pfeiffer round three, which would be really nasty. So let's take a look at some of these some of these odds here. Um, so Pfeiffer, let's see it rounds. Pfeiffer round one, that's way too pedestrian. Pfeiffer round two even, I mean, that's not bad. Pfeiffer round three plus 1,000, wow. Or Pfeiffer by decision plus 650. See, what's interesting about this variation is that Pfeiffer is, uh, does have a, a decent wrestling. So it's possible that he gets the win. You know, he get, makes his points. He you know, gets ahead and then gets a takedown and just probably just stays out of trouble. You know, because listen, he knows that 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 near shard is, you know, has a lot of submissions in him. So I think this is very reasonable. So we're going to play Pfeiffer by decision uh, plus 650. All right, Luana Pinheiro versus Michelle Waterston. Um, this one's tough, I have to say. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna try to come up with something because people are on. I would say more most people are on Waterson. So I guess if I had to pick a side, I'm not playing, and that that would be Waterson. I also have heard like lots of different ways for Waterson to win. I've heard that she can maybe get a reversal and submission. I've heard that she can win by decision. So. There's really no value in the Waterson side. The only thing I could probably get is, is some value on Pinheiro. Um, and the only bet I can make is probably her by decision. Because one thing I have her is that she's going to be much more aggressive than Waterston. Is that the longer the fight goes, the more likely is that Waterson might take over. So I think there's going to be some inherent value in Pinheiro by decision. So we're going to do that. Pinheiro by decision. Plus 130. All right. Chris Gurris versus Kevin Gastelum. All right. This one is going to be gross. You guys ain't going to like it, but we're going to do it anyway. So we have Chris Curtis, who is a pretty much pure boxer. Kevin Gastelum, who he could put in some wrestling. But one thing that I know for sure I've heard some people like Curtis. I've heard some people like Gastelum. But the one thing I've heard for sure is that this is going to be a fight that goes to the uh, scorecards. So what we are going to do is pick somebody inside the distance, if not the whole fight. Um, the, this, the, let's just look at each side and then we'll, just, we'll see what we want to do here. Um, round props. Well, round one, I mean, this is not going round one, really. Can't play either of these guys by decision. Curtis round three plus 1,600. Gastelum round three plus 1,600. Can Gastelum get a takedown and submit him? I, I, I don't know which what method of victory this is going to be, so I can't do this. So I'm just going to have to bet the under here. So um, we have... Under 2.5 is what? Uh, plus 180. That's going to be good enough for me. All right, moving on, we have um, Raul Rosas Jr. versus Christian Rodriguez. Um, Okay, tough one. Because Christian Rodriguez has been getting some publicity as a decent underdog here. So uh, him at money line is not happening. Rosas, um, the idea is that he's very aggressive, but he could be sloppy, and that this fight is going to finish by by somebody getting submitted. But more to the point, if Rosas wins, it's going to be by submission. But if Rodriguez wins, maybe he go. He might listen. He might get a submission, or he might go to decision. So what we th what I think we're going to do here is play Rosas to win by decision. He can get his takedowns. He doesn't have to get the submission to win. 
So we're going to try that. I bet we get like five to one on that. Let's take a look. Rosas by decision. Ooh, only plus 225. Yeah, that's not going to be good enough value. We're going to have to do the op. We're going to have to play Rosas round three. That's the closest thing, right? Boy, oh, boy. You know, Rosas by decision looks like such a bad bet that it's probably going to work. We're going to do it. Rosas by decision plus 225. Okay. Um, a couple more, right? So Kevin Holland versus Santiago Ponzinibbio. Um Holland is a finisher, and if he's going to win, he's going to get the KO. Uh, that is at least what I'm hearing from everybody. So what this means is that Holland by KO is out of play. Um, Ponzinibbio, uh, I have heard a little bit of him for uh, as kind of a live underdog. Um, so him at Moneyline is probably not going to be a great idea. The only thing I can come up with as far as something that the two things are not going to be bet are either a Holland by decision or a Ponzinibbio by finish. I mean, that's kind of gross. So I'm going to go with the Holland by decision, uh, which would be plus 225. By the way, we're already like 0 for 10. Like we're never winning any of these bets. That's fine. Rob Font versus Adrian Yanez. Full striker's delight here. Um, Yanez with most of the KO upside, but Font with more of the, you know, the volume upside. So Font's main source, main path to victory is going to be um, by decision, where Yanez is, is going to be by KO. Uh, those the two binary outcomes I'm hearing. So those are the two that we can't bet. Um so it's a question of whether we want to go something with font inside the distance or a Yanez by decision. I wonder what's better. I wonder what where you can get a better price. Let's take a look. Now, here's I have a bet that I'm really considering here, and I want to I want to look at this. So let's look at font's winning method. Font by KO is plus 650. The font by submission at plus 1600 is, is really tempting to me because font does have wrestling and he does have takedowns and it's very possible that he can get one. And if he does, I mean, we have not seen Yanez at all kind of fight that off. So I'm really tempted to play him by submission, but but we're not going to. We're either going to play him by just inside the distance or we'll play Giannis by decision. Giannis by decision is only plus 275. That seems a little pedestrian. So we're we're going to play font by 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 uh by finish. Now again, I'm not going to play just by KO cuz I do think a submission is kind of in the cards here. Um so I will play font by take KO or submission plus for plus 500. Um, okay. Two more. Yep. Co-main event, Gilbert Burns versus Jorge Masvidal. Um, Gilbert Burns with a big, big bunch of recency bias, if you want to know the truth. I mean, he, um, first round, he took care of, who is it? Not Nate Maness. Now I forget who it was. And then before that, he almost beat Shemaev. I mean, this guy's like on fire. Okay. And despite the fact that he's 38 years old or whatever, it's kind of like the resurgence of his career. Not to mention that Masvidal, he's just going to, you know, he he's really, you know, I don't want to say a fraud, but but he hasn't really done much recently. And that, you know, Burns is just going to come and take him down and just freaking destroy him. And unfortunately, that's just not the way life works. Okay. Um, it's not that easy for that to happen. Just because people say it's the only way this fight can go, it does not make it so. The one couple of things I would point out. Number one is that what you hear all the time is that father time is undefeated, meaning that older fighters, you know, are, are much more prone to losing. But for whatever reason, in this fight, it doesn't matter. 
you know? Um, for this reason, you know, for, but for some reason in this fight, Gilbert Burns being 38 or whatever, it doesn't matter. He just took, you know, he, he, he just came off of two big fights. He, you're telling me he has to just get better and better each time at 38? Um, the other thing is that Burns taking down Masvidal is not so easy either, okay? Masvidal is pretty good takedown defense. So I think what we're going to do is either play Burns by decision or Masvidal straight up, and, and that's really, really rough. Let's take a look. You got Mas Burns by decision is plus 165. Or you could play Masvidal plus, plus 350. You know what you could do? I mean, this is – you could play him by KO. The problem with playing him by KO is that there's way too much recency bias. In other words, you still pe see the highlights of his, like, flying knee. So I just don't think I can do that. So it's either going to be Masvidal plus 350 or Burns by decision. Um, huh. Ah, let's just do it. We'll, 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 you know what? We're going to, we're going to do the father time is undefeated thing. We'll take Masvidal plus the 350. No idea how he's going to do it, but we'll just, we'll just have him do it. That's like the worst bet you'll ever make. But you'll be right there with me losing if you make it. Um, okay. And in the main event, we have Alex Pereira versus Israel Adesanya. Um, and, in this fight, you had uh, Israel Adesanya, who is the was the favorite in his last in their last fight, and he was on the verge of winning, and then he ended up losing, um, and they made him a minus one thirty again. Um, so, what people are saying, and this is going to be really kind of annoying, is that this reminds everybody of the Usman Edwards fight. You had Edwards who knocked him out as an underdog. And then they didn't give him any respect. They made him the underdog again, and he won again. So naturally, you're supposed to take Perea. No thanks. We're going to take Israel Adesanya in this spot. Um, the only question is, is how are we going to play it? The other thing that I've heard is that Adesanya is not much of a finisher. So why don't we take a shot at Adesanya inside the distance now you have gonna have to hold me back here because in these main event fights i mean i've been picking like exact rounds and i know that's probably bad but i want i want to look at it anyway adesanya in round four like for example is like plus 2200 i mean you see him like you know he gets the fight he wants maybe he gets a takedown or something you know, maybe he gets a submission. What is, what is, oh my God, what is Adesanya by submission? I'm going to lose it. If he's like 20 to one or something, can't be 20 to one. 14 to one. 14 to one at Asanya by submission or 14 or 20, whatever to one in round four. I, I can't help it. I'm just going to do it. I, I'm going to, I'm going to go round four. Round four, or round five. That'd be so. That'd be so legendary if after Pahea won round five the first time, Adesanya won round five the, the, the next time. But we're gonna play Adesanya round four for twenty two to one. Good luck. So just to uh, just to reiterate, and nobody has that by the way. So just to reiterate, we have Amron win by decision. That's losing. You have Garcia by decision. That's losing. Ogden plus 310. Are you kidding me? Godinez by TK or submission. All right, that has a small chance, I guess. Carl Williams by TK or submission. That has a small chance. Pfeiffer by decision. All right, Eric, you're out of your mind. Pinheiro by decision. That's fine, I guess. Under two and a half. Curtis Gastelum, the most boring fight on the card. No way. But we're trying it. Rosas by decision. Yeah, sure. Holland by decision. The guy who never wins a fight other than by finish. But... Fine. Uh, well, we know about this fight, right? Yanez, either Yanez KO or fought by decision. So why not? Fought inside the distance. Masvidal, I mean, against against Gilbert Burns, who's completely rejuvenated. 
okay? Plus 350, no problem. Uh, and Itasanya, Israel Adesanya, round floor, plus 2,200. All of them for 180. We're going to stake all singles. Where is that? Stake all singles for 180. Now, I can't put it in until I remove the Zoom, but you'll have to trust me for $2,340. Good luck, everybody. You're going to need it.